Go to uh, hold hold a spot in find your spot in Second Corinthians chapter three, and just put a marker there. I'll just put my uh, two year old bookmarker son in there. Second uh, Corinthians chapter three. You guys don't have anything as cool as this at the Father's Day gift right there. Second <laughs> Corinthians chapter three. And then we're going to turn to Exodus chapter 34. So we'll come back to 2 Corinthians and spend the majority of our time there. But I want to uh, lay a little bit of groundwork so you understand the background. I know many of you have probably heard this story and um, have read through your Bibles. I'm sure it's probably a familiar uh, passage of Scripture. God bless you. Um, but uh, just want to lay this out. Maybe you've never read this before. Maybe you haven't got to Exodus. Maybe you skipped Exodus. Maybe you thought Exodus was boring. I thought Exodus was great. Amen? I think all the Word of God is great. All right. So uh, Exodus chapter 34. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. If you have a Bible, I hope you have a King James Bible this morning. That's where I'm going to be preaching from. God's holy, infallible, inspired Word of God for the English-speaking people. Praise God for the men and women who died for that Bible. Amen? Amen. Praise God for His preservation of Scripture. Exodus chapter 34, let's go to verse 28. Exodus 34, 28. And he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water, and he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with them. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. And Moses called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses talked with them. And afterward, all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. Until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he, he was commanded. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I do thank you uh, for the glory of God. Thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, in coming to this world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Father, I do thank you for these type people that come this morning. I pray that your word would go forth, and as your word says, it will accomplish where unto you send it. Father, it will not return unto you void. I do pray that you empty me of myself, fill me with thy spirit. Give me the words to say, and refrain from my lips those things which I ought not to say. Father, I pray that you speak to us this morning. May your spirit move upon us in our, in our midst. And may, we, may your son have all the glory and honor due his high and holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. Well, now we'll flip over to uh, that spot that you were holding in, in Second Corinthians chapter three. Second Corinthians chapter three. <clears throat> thank you for turning there, and thank you for standing. So in Exodus thirty-four, we just read of a little scenario with Moses coming out of the mount. His face was shown with the glory of uh, God, or like as it were. And speaking with him, um, and prior to that, in Exodus 32, Moses broke the first um, the first tables of stone that God gave him, written with God's finger. Um, but uh, now in Corinthians, we're going to look at a little bit of that and kind of go into a distinguishing um, sermon about the differences between the law and the the uh, grace, the ministry of the Spirit. He, he starts off in verse five, and we're not going to read this whole thing, but um, I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but he says in verse 5, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. And folks, I can assure you that God's not looking for some big one to fulfill uh, a, a ministry somewhere. He's not looking for a big shot. He's not looking for a big somebody, because if he did that, he wouldn't use me, and he wouldn't use you. Amen? Amen? Well, what do you mean? Uh, God chooses the weak things of this world for his servants to serve him. Amen? Amen. Uh, I find often as a pastor that people who are struggling with the most things, <clears throat> the most joyous people, things who have the most hardships in life, and that they can give any excuse in the world to not do something for God, those are the ones who are serving God. Amen. Well, I'm not saying, here's Pastor, you're saying that I have to have a broken leg to serve God? No, no, no. I'm just saying that the majority of people uh, that, ha that are serving God are those who have some kind of pain or ailment uh, in that aspect. Uh, go to, uh, uh, 
go flip back over to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 1. You'll see what I'm talking about. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look at verse uh, 26. It says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are. Why? Why did he do those things? That no flesh should glory in his presence. Amen. Now, back over to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. You say, we're turning, this is like a Bible study this morning. Well, slow down, keep your fingers hot. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, look at verse 6. Uh, back at verse 5, in that last uh, several words there, it says, but our sufficiency of a, is of God. He's not uh, being sufficient in of a, himself. He's thinking he's anything. He's saying, look, everything that we're doing, this ministry that we're doing, I'm writing this letter to you. My sufficiency and our sufficiency is of God. He says, who hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Amen. Not of the letter, what is that speaking of? The law, but of the Spirit of grace, the New Covenant, the New Testament. Uh, the law condemns us, does it not? Paul would tell us that in Romans. Uh, the law says that you and I are guilty sinners. Uh, when I come to I wouldn't know what sin was had not the law been there to tell me what it was. Amen? But the Mosaic law never gave life. It never had any life in it. It didn't have life-giving properties in it. It was a way of life, not a way to life. Right. Please remember that. It was not a way of life, it was but a, a, a way, uh, it was a way of life, but never a way to life. Amen. Uh, the law never saved anyone. The law is a killer. It condemns Amen. you. Amen. Amen. It slays us as guilty before God, as wretched sinners that we are, or once were, so that we can be resurrected by a new testator, Amen. by a new testament. All right, now verse 7 he says, But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly, here it is, behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. And he's not done there, he's speaking, but we're going to take our time in verse 7 here. He says, the ministration. What is that? That means the attendance as a servant or what a minister ought to be, a pastor Amen. ought to be, a deacon, and deacon's wife ought to be. Uh, what a Christian ought to be as a bond slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. But he's saying the, the service of that, so now he's making a distinction, a comparison, if you will, between uh, the law of Moses and this ministry of the Spirit. And so it's classified here in verse 7 as what? The ministration of death is what it says. And, and we know that that's the law of Moses. Uh, how do you know that? Because he continues on. He says, written and engraved in stone. Okay, class, what was written and engraved in stone? The ten? Exactly, that's what it is. So he could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which was to be done away. God's law is absolutely holy. Amen. Amen. His law is absolutely holy, and I'm not going to disparage the law. Uh, the dispensation of the law had its own glory. Amen. Amen. In Romans 7, 12, Paul says, Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. And so in the midst of this glory, uh, Moses was wrapped up. His face was covered of it. Uh, he was the mediator of that covenant. Amen. You know, I, I was asking my wife yesterday, I said, you know, Moses walked down and had the law of God written with his hands uh, to give to the people. But what was going on with the people? They were breaking the first two, Amen. having other gods and worshiping other gods and making other gods out of gold and raising up the golden calf. And he, did, and he came down and he broke those. Why? He couldn't go into the camp because they'd be consumed with the law. The law is a killer. Amen? Mm -hmm. So he had to go back up and intercede and said, don't destroy them. He had to intercede and he had to write the law and then go give it to them. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Amen? You're like, I don't know where you're getting at, Pastor. I know. I just, I guess I think too much. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, the, the, uh, Moses is in there. He's wrapped up. His, this glory is being covered. Um, and when he came down off the mountain the second time with the tables in his hands, um, the skin of his face, it shone. Uh, as if the glory of God and that covenant was reflected in it. They, they were afraid to come unto Moses because of his face and it was shining. And the shining of his face, Paul says here in verse 7, that um, 
It was the glory of his countenance. And that was the reflection of the, glorious God, uh, of the glory of God as seen in his face in spending time with God in 40 days in that mount. And he says here that uh, there is a kind of glory about the Old Testament. There's nothing wrong with the Old Testament. When you run into people on the street, you go soul winning, they always attack the God of the Old Testament. Amen? They're fine with the New Testament God, but they'll always attack the Old Testament God. There's nothing wrong with the Old Testament. Can I get an amen? amen. Some of y'all are like, oh, I hate the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament. That's primarily what I preach out of. But I love the Old Testament, but we have the New. Obviously, the apostles and the, and the first century Christians are going off of the Old Testament to prove those things that are written about Christ. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Christ on the road to Emmaus says, you fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken about me. And he showed them in the law and the prophets and the Psalms all the things concerning himself. Yeah, right? Where did he get that from? The New Testament wasn't written yet. Right. Amen. He added yeah, it right. in the Old Testament. So I love the Old Testament, but and there's a glory about that in the Old Covenant. There's an attractiveness about it in the Old Covenant, uh, symbolized here by the brightness of Moses' face. So God made his face to shine, not Moses. It was grace, not grease, that was making it shine. Amen? I thought you all laugh at that one. But God also made it fade. He made it fade. Because he wanted to teach something by that. It was a fading glory. Not, not your clothing brain, faded glory, that you get at Walmart, but fading glory. And so the work of the Spirit in the gospel is, is much more glorious um, because then we can behold the face of Jesus Christ, um, which will never be done away. Amen. All right, I don't know what we're getting at, Pastor. Just stay with me, all right? Christ will never fade away. Amen. Amen. Why will he never fade away? Because he is eternal. His word is eternally true. Amen. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Amen. 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 Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. And so now he's saying, um, when he's saying the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, was to fade away. It was never to stay. The, 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 the thing that God set up in, the, in what he set up in the sacrifices was always a picture of something. It was never meant to bring anyone to God. Amen. Amen. It was just his way and, and his means of uh, people bringing it and his grace of thereby, because nothing is uh, nothing can be covered without the shedding of blood. Amen. Amen. Without the remission or, or without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Amen. And it was a picture of something that would come, and it was to be done away. The glory and that Moses' face was shining, and that veil is coming over to show that it was a fading glory. Number eight or verse eight. How shall not the ministration? Of the Spirit be rather glorious. So he's giving a, 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 a comparison here between the ministration of death and the ministration of the Spirit. Uh, he's saying if the ministration of death is glorious, how much more the ministration of the Spirit? Amen. If, if the Old Testament and the law and all that was, was glorious, how much more the New Testament is glorious? Amen? Amen. Uh, so the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the gospel here, and the, the, the new covenant is called the ministry of the Spirit because Amen. it results in the giving of the Holy Spirit to those who receive the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. by faith, by grace, through faith, right? The gospel and his finished work upon the cross, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Even, even a three-year-old knows it. Amen. My son was telling me the other day, he said, what's the gospel? He says, the death, burial, and resurrection. <laughs> How does a three-year-old know right. that? But we have some Christians that have been in churches who think they're saved. I shouldn't say Christians. Christians who think they're saved don't even know the gospel. Amen. Uh, we have Christians in, in, in our churches that, 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 that can't even go out on the street and witness to somebody. And they say, what saves you? We'll say this prayer real quick. Well, make sure you cry a lot for repentance. Well, make, make sure you change, you, you know, you, you get morally right and, and come to Christ and accept him as Lord and Savior. They have no idea what you're talking about. Amen. It is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. It is all the work of God. It's not of our work. Amen. Right. Amen. It's all of God. It's his work and his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So if the law is glorious as it's shown as Moses' face did, which was to be done away, not the law, but the glory of the law, Amen. right? How shall not the work of the new covenant be more glorious? It is more glorious. Why? Because of Christ. It all pointed to Christ. It's more glorious because of him. Amen? It's all that. Right? Stay with me, people. I know you're looking at me like sheep, deer in the headlights. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. So he's kind of saying the same thing. You're like, what's the, what, I don't get this. 
The ministration of condemnation is the law. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. But walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Amen. Amen. The, the condemnation does not come from God. Condemnation comes from the devil. Amen. Amen. Your condemnation can come from God's law in, 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 in what? In telling you, hey, you're a sinner. <sighs> you're condemned to die. Amen. Amen. For God sent not his son to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. Amen. That's why God sent his son into the world, right? Why? Because he loves the world. Amen. Amen? Amen. He loves Amen. the world. So it's this. What, what is the ministry of, of condemnation? Verse 9. The ministration of condemnation be glory. It's everybody who tries to live a life that's pleasing to God uh, by self-effort always discovers uh, that they'll never quite make it because they never know that they have done enough. They'll never know if they've done enough. Amen. Right? I ran into a lady the other day and I said, you go to heaven when you die? She's like, I don't know if I've done enough. You don't have to do anything. It's Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's Praise it. I was like, if you trust it on the Lord, that's it. I'm secure in that. Amen? Right. Amen. All right. A couple of y'all agree with me. It's, it's Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm secure in Jesus Christ. Yeah. If I'm in Christ, right, uh, for, for uh, what was what did Paul tell Timothy? He says, For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against Amen. that day. He's like, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm persuaded. I'm fully persuaded that it's always of Christ. It's Amen. always been of God. Right? Go to Hebrews chapter 10 real quick. Hold your spot there in 2 Corinthians. Hebrews chapter 10. You're like, we're jumping everywhere. I know. You guys aren't excited. I am. That's all right. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 10. Jump down to verse 4. The ministration of condemnation. That's the law. That is, that is uh, someone trying to do everything in their own works, okay? Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4 says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and, uh, and of goats should take away sins. But yet there's people today that believe that the blood of bulls and goats can take away sins. Amen. Because you're justified by the law. No, you can't be justified by the law. Paul would make that evidently practically clear. He says, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the what? Law. Law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. How often? Once for all. Once for all, O sinner, receive it. Once for all, believer, believe it. <laughs> Amen? Amen. That's what it is. Once for all, Christ did it on the cross. He says you don't have to have any more sacrifice for sin. He taketh away the first and he receives the second. Amen. You know Christ rejects your first birth, but he accepts your second one. Hallelujah. Born it again did. Amen? That's what I'm talking about. The ministration of condemnation is the law. The, the law could do nothing to get anybody saved. And, and so much more... Uh, go back to 1 Corinthians. I'm going too fast. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Wherever the preacher told you the first time to go, go there. All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. He says, For the ministration of condemnation be glory. If that's glorious, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. Amen. Right? The Old Testament, the law, that's great. It had its own glory. But now the ministration of righteousness exceeds in in glory. Amen. And Paul's making a, a, a distinction here. If you look, uh, I don't want to take too much time to look at it, but maybe quickly, verse 7, it says, but if. Verse 9, for if. Verse 9 in the, in the second part, much more. Verse 10 says, for even. Verse 11 says, for if, and then much more. There's a, there's a distinction, there's a, there's a contrast being dealt here uh, by, the, by the Apostle Paul in saying, look, if it's this way and it was glorious here, much more it is in the new. Amen. If it's glorious in the old, much more it is in exceedingly abundantly in the new, right? Much more describes uh, from the lesser, the fading glory of the law, amen? The fading glory of the law amen. to the continually superabounding glory of the gospel. And so the ministration of righteousness is what? It's the work of the gospel 
in general, of righteousness, right? Of reconciliation we've been dealing with the last Amen. couple of weeks, right? If the, if the service uh, of the law, the work of the law is glorious, then Jesus Christ's work is far more exceeding glorious. Praise the Lord. And then he says in verse 10, For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. Man, he's using that word a lot. Amen. The Amen. law of Moses was glorious. Pastor, I get it. Do you get it? I want you to leave your knowing this. The law of Moses was glorious. Amen. Amen. But in comparison to the glory, in this, the glory of Christ, it is as if the law has no glory. Amen. And it, it, it pales in comparison to the Amen. glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. The glory of the ministration of the Spirit for Christ is what? He's far above everything Amen. else. Yeah. He's far above principalities and powers. Amen. Amen. They're Amen. subject unto him. Why? Why? Why is the ministration of righteousness far more exceeding uh, than the law? Because the Spirit draws us to Christ, and Christ's job is to draw us and make us back united with God. Amen. That's Amen. why it's far more glorious. Because the law couldn't do that, but Christ can, Amen. and He did it once and for all. Amen. There remained no more sacrifice for si for sins. Excuse me. And it's the glorious gospel of the blessed God. And it's a very, uh, uh, the, glo the glory of the grace of God is fulfilled in the ministration of the spirit of the God. Amen? Amen. Praise Amen. God. It's, a, it's, it's glorious indeed. Right? Uh, just for illustration purposes, the moon, the moon shines bright. Does it not? The yeah. moon shines bright. What is that song in Texas? The stars at night. The stars at night are big and bright. Where? Deep in the heart of Texas. Right? Who's from Texas? Anybody from Texas? All right. Praise God. All right. So, I'm not from there. <laughs> so, right. But anyway, the, the moon is just as bright uh, as the sun. But once the sun comes up, the glory of the moon is gone. Amen. That's what we're talking about here. It's a fading glory. I hope that makes sense. Like, I, I don't understand that one. It's, it's brightness of the moon is completely set apart in comparison to the sun. Amen. The sun is the greater light, right? Paul, or God would write and uh, uh, give us to us in Genesis, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. Now you already know the difference, right? Amen. It pales in comparison of the light and the brightness of the sun. And so Amen. the brightness of Moses' face revealed the splendor of his ministry. Amen. It was a glorious ministry. Right? Thank God for the law. We have it. But when we compare it with the ministry which proclaims the, um, uh, the righteousness for men whom the law condemns, what do, what do we say then? It, it, imparts, it, it imparts not letters written in stones, but the abiding presence of the lifeblood, the life-giving spirit. That glory of the former covenant then fades utterly away. Why? Because it's done away in Christ. Amen. Christ is the new covenant. He's the testator. Amen. Here's the New yes. Testament. That's right. And so, uh, and, 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 and we think only of the uh, greater splendor of the ministry of the new covenant, Jesus Christ, because we're New Testament saints. We don't focus too much on the law. Why? Because we're saved by grace. Amen. Amen. Yes, we're right. saved by grace. We're kept by grace. Amen. We're brought through by grace. We're growing in grace. Yes. We're growing in the knowledge of God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Amen. And now verse 11, he says, For if... That which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Like, man, Paul is really hitting on this. Yeah, he wants you to know thrice times over of a thrice holy God how glorious his ministration is. Amen. He says it is glorious, it's exceeding glorious, it's super abounding glorious. This new ministration of the Spirit is far surpassing Amen. the glory of the law. Amen? No glory of the old covenant. Why? The law is a mirror. And then the law is a mirror. It's not, it's not a bar of soap. You can't get clean through the law. You look at the law and you say, man, I'm dirty, I need a shower, right? You get home from work, I'm dirty, I need a shower. I just got back from the office. I'm dirty and I need a shower. Whatever it is, you're dirty and you need a shower, amen? We look in the mirror to see the condition of our countenance, do we not? Right? And the, the law shows us that we're sinners. Right? I, I tell my boys, they're only uh, five, seven, and eight years old. I say, what's the first thing that people need to know so that they can come to Christ? They need to know that they're sinners. Amen. But in love, obviously, condemning them and pulling your finger. Yeah. They need to know that they are standing before a holy, holy, holy. What is that? The angels say separate, separate, separate from sin God. Amen. And you can in no way approach God in your own merit. Amen. You have to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't know you're a sinner, then you'll never need to have God in your life. You'll never, you'll never care about Jesus Christ because he is the Savior of the world and not for our sins only. He's the propitiation and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. First John 2, 2. Amen. Amen. 
So it's not a bar of soap. The law is a mirror, right? I need a makeover. I need a shower. I'm dirty. The law is not a surgeon. It cannot remove cancer. The law simply gives us the diagnosis of the state of man. One, that you are so far a sinner and so separate from God that you need a Savior. And then that, right. is, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the office of the law is to, to show us the disease, is to show us the sin in such a way that it shows no hope. It shows us no hope uh, of, of, of anything. It's, it's, it's just a cruelness of the law. And I, I, when I look to that, when I see that, when I see the tables of stone, there is no hope in that. Amen. I can't have any, uh, any hope in that. But the Bible, Paul says, that he is our blessed hope. Right. He is the amen. hope that we are looking for. Amen. He is our hope. Amen. Somebody say, man, I got one person. Like, I guess he's our hope. I don't know. Pastor says so. I don't say though. The Bible says so. Amen. Amen. So the new covenant brings a remedy to those who are far beyond hope. It brings a remedy in that what? But unto you that fear my name, the Son, S-U-N, of righteousness, arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Malachi 4.2. Right? The glory of the new covenant is greater. Why? Because uh, uh, it provides a way for man to become righteous in the sight of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And that is what is meant by when he says it's a greater glory. It's a far more exceeding uh, 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 glory. Right? Christ, as the son of righteousness, the S-U-N of righteousness, has thrown Moses into the shade. It just like the sun comes up and the moon fades away, Christ rises in our hearts and fades Moses Amen. away. It says we don't, we don't, we don't, we're, we're not condemned by the law. We're not bound by the law. We're in grace now. Amen. Amen. And so the glory of His face was fading. Moses, the mediator, mediator of the old covenant, uh, manifested a degree of glory. It was glorious. I'm not saying anything about that. But while it was glory, it was fading. Right. And so in the, verse eight through eleven that we're reading here. For if much more, for even for if much more, right? If the law was glorious, much more that the new uh, covenant is more glorious. Amen. It just continues to belabor the point. You can read this till you get blue in the face and still not understand. Or you can get say and say, all right, I get it, Pastor. It's fading, it's fading, it's fading. Fading means what? What does fading mean? What does it to mean to be done away? It means the glory was continuously being rendered inoperative and ineffective, which emphasizes the temporary nature of the old covenant. Amen. It was it was fading away. It, it was it was very active in the old testament, but it was never meant to be permanent. Amen. Amen. It was never meant to be permanent. The glory of Moses' face was rendered ineffective. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you mean? Because in the sense of his brightness was diminishing. Um, it, relatively speaking, it only lasted for a short period of time. That's what the law was. Hey, 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 we have this, you know, this is great, but uh, but this is only for a set purpose. Because what it, what it, what it, uh, what does Hebrews say? God, who at sundry times has spoken to us in, in times past by the prophets, has indeed, hath in these last days spoken to us by his son. Amen. Right? You know, when, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son to come Amen. into the world. And then when Amen. God chose and found out it was necessary, found out, he knew it was necessary. He says, Amen. that's the time. That's when I'm going to come. That's when I'm going to establish my new covenant. That's when grace is going to be coming. Uh, well, grace has been out through all the Old Testament. Don't misunderstand me. Pastor, you're getting me confused. Let's get back to this. Paul is telling the believers here and us today of the fading glory of the Old, of the old Covenant. Christ is the end of the law of... Uh, uh, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Amen? Amen. Christ is the end. The, the Jews don't see that he is the fulfillment of the whole law. They don't. Uh, it comes from their, their Bible, the Talmud, and all those things. But <coughs> Paul says this in Philippians 3, 9, And being found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Amen. Right? He would list his pedigree and says, Look, if anybody if anybody can boast in works, I am more. He says, I'm circumcised the eighth day. I'm a Jew of the <laughs> Jews. Right? I'm a, I was born of the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I had it all, man. It was good. I was... Of the law, no, no, not even at one point have I offended in any of the law. He was just going and going and going. He says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Amen. 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 I counted those things but done. So the civil law is done away, right? Jews and Gentiles are now one. We're grafted into the tree. And then the body of Christ, the mystery of the body, Amen. right? But the ceremonial law is set aside 
No more Sabbaths, no more, no more moons, uh, no more uh, feasts, no more sacrificial system. The temple's destroyed. Uh, no more sacrifices. That's all done away with. Amen. And you need to be careful. If you haven't heard of this group, it's called the Hebrew Roots Movement. And they want to bring Christians back into the law. And they tell you, oh, well, you know, Paul didn't mean this. And there's an attack on Paul like ever before. Amen? Amen. There's an attack on Paul. So, look, I mean, if you want to look into it, do a little study on it. I just barely heard of this recently, the Hebrews, Hebrew Roots Movement. I'm sure it's kind of old. It's just something else packaged up in a new name. That's it. Amen. Something old packaged up in new wrapping paper. So the moral law is repeated and recited in the New Testament, is it not? Amen. The ceremonial law isn't, but the moral law is. Why? Because it's written in your heart. Amen. Right? And Romans 2.15 tells me the meanwhile, while we're witnessing to someone, the meanwhile, their thoughts accusing him or else excusing him of their behavior before God. Amen. So the law is written on their hearts. Amen? There's Amen. a moral law. What is it wrong to kill children? Yes. Yes. Amen. Is it wrong to kill babies? Yes. Is it wrong to rape women? Yes. Is it wrong to molest children? Yes. Amen. Is it is it wrong to be a homosexual? Yes. Yeah, amen. And so, uh, how do we know those things? Because something inherently inside of us, the law of God is written on our hearts, and we know that there's a God. Amen. Right? We have general revelation. We can look out in the in the universe and see the hand and crafty work and the mightiness of God, and then we get God has given us His Word and given us special revelation amen. so that we can know Him personally. Amen. amen. And so, how do we know that the moral law is reiterated and brought before the sinner to show him his sin? No, it's to break the sinner's back and say, "I give up. It's all Christ." Yes. It has to be all Christ. Yes. Uh, but if the old covenant was by itself, if, if it was just the old covenant by itself, it would be absolutely useless. Amen. What do you mean? Uh, because even the, the, the reflection of the holiness of God was useless to save, i.e. Moses' face. Just because his reflection came, they're like, oh, well, that, that can't do anything of itself. Why? Because it's fading away. Amen. It's fading away, and it's all to be fulfilled and finished in Christ. And so the new covenant comes and by grace through faith provides what the old covenant could never provide. Amen. Amen. Therefore, the new covenant, which Jesus said is what, and we're going to celebrate it tonight, is my blood of the New Testament shed for you. That's right. And as often as you drink this cup and eat this bread, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Amen. So what do you mean? This new covenant uh, is eternally superior to the old covenant. Amen. Look at verse 11 one last time. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth, uh, 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 that which remaineth is glorious. The new covenant, the good news, the gospel of grace, the ministry of the Spirit, the ministry of righteousness. When he says remaineth, which remaineth, it means to abide. It's the present tense of that word, meaning what? Even now. He doesn't say uh, uh, much more that which remained is glorious. He says remaineth. Even unto this day it is Amen. remaining something that is set uh, in, the, in, in the heart of God. Right? It indicates the glory of the new covenant is never ending. The New Testament is never ending. Amen? Amen. And, and look, you can amend the Constitution, can we not? We have amendments to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know history. Uh, <laughs> we can, you can amend the Constitution. You can replace uh, old concepts for new concepts. Uh, you can update the, the justice system. Absolutely, it needs updating. Uh, but this new covenant right here that was fulfilled as Christ does not need to be replaced. Amen. It does not need to be updated. Amen. It does not need to be amended. It is fully Amen. accomplished as all of Amen. God's redemptive objectives. Amen? And through Christ, men and women can trust in Him and be saved. Amen? Amen. God has made it, made it abundantly clear to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Repentance towards God and faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He said, well, how, how did the Jew have a chance? Did the Jews have any chance? Go to, uh, if you have the time to turn there, go to Jeremiah chapter 31. I don't have the time, so Bob is going to go there anyway. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Just listen if you can't find it quick enough. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord. That what? I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. 
Oh, no, they didn't have a chance. The Jews did have a chance, but they rejected Amen. Christ. Said his blood be upon us and our children, and now it's open up to the Gentiles. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. God for that. Right? Jesus, Jesus says, look, I think not that I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to what? Fulfill. Amen. I've come to fulfill. And, 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 and we'll, we'll get an understanding, you know, we'll get new understanding of the richness of the gospel in Christ, amen? We'll, we'll continuously grow, we'll get that understanding of the richness of the gospel as we grow, but we'll never get beyond the gospel. Amen. Why? Because there's nothing beyond the gospel, amen? amen. That is it. That is, that is what God has chosen. There's nothing beyond the New Testament. Why? There's nothing beyond the New Testament. Why? I can't, you know, I can't help but think that Paul, when he's writing these, when he's writing this stuff, he's saying, for if this, but much more this. And uh, I can't help but think that Paul is talking about himself, right? He's looking back at the days when he was going to his pedigree, when he was uh, counting on his background, his skill, his dedicatedness of his heart, right? He says, I, I, I'm jealous for you, Lord. That's why I'm going to kill Christians. And he says, who art thou, Lord? He says, I'm Jesus whom thou is, whom thou is persecuting, Amen. right? He says, you're persecuting my body. That's me you're doing that to. He says, Amen. oh, Lord, what would you have me to do? Amen. What would you have me to do? And Paul's looking back. He says, look, those things that I count that were gained to me, those I counted loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Those things that I, I, I gained, I count them but dumb that I may win Christ. Amen. He says, those things that I, I thought I could get to heaven by my background, by my skill, by my heart, uh, when I was under the old covenant of the law, the ministry of death, the ministry of condemnation, he's saying, look, I've come now to understand that God does the work. Amen. God is at work in me and so much more than I could ever have done. Yes. Amen. Uh, I understand that Christ's work is in me is so far more effective beyond anything that I can ask or think. Praise and that God. all the glory that I thought I had done is nothing but oh. done compared with the glory of God at work in me. That's all it is. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Amen. Amen. The old covenant of the law has lost its splendor. Amen. Not fully, but it's lost its splendor. And I know that even, Paul saying, I know that even in my weakness, God is able to work through me. And that's what I count on. What are you talking about? Back in verse 5. Not that we're sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. He says, I, I, I can't count on those things that I was raised up in. I can't go back to my degrees, right? I, I don't care how many things you got after your name, right? I'm a C-H-R-A-S-C-I-N. Amen. That's all I need. Amen. But Paul is saying, look, I... I the, the weakness that is in me, God is able to work through me, right? He says, You're, when, when I am weak, then I'm made strong. Right? My grace is sufficient for thee. I'm not sufficient in the things that I thought I was sufficient in. Why? My sufficiency is of God. Amen. He's defending his apostleship. Over and over again, he has to do this. He says, look, I'm, I'm not coming to you with bold words and big words. He's like, but in very plainness of speech in verse 12. Because why? He has that great hope. What happens as a result is, is far more thrilling and adventurous when I allow God to do the work, when I'm not trusting in all this other stuff, but just having my sufficiency in Christ. What happens as a result is far more thrilling and adventurous than anything that ever happened before. Amen. That's what Paul's saying. He says, Every, everything that I thought was great and adventurous, it now is done away in the old. It's come into the new. And God is using me for who I am, not Amen. because of what I could do for him. He loves you for who you are. Amen. Amen. Oh, I got to do this for God. Oh, I got to do that for God. No, you just need to be faithful. Amen. Be found as a steward. And moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. That's Amen. it. Just be faithful to God. That's what he wants you to be. It doesn't matter if you do this or have these have these degrees or anything, right? We don't we don't have to have a big slide uh, as big as the neighbor slide. We have a little slide that's just as good, ain't it? Ain't it, Ambrose? Do you like our slide? Good, I'm gonna take the slide away. It's gone today, right? <laughs> right? That's the Christian life. The world is looking to see some Christians who have that type of life. The, 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 the world is a very dark place, but we are children of light. We shine in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Amen. 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 An absolutely perverse nation who says wrong is right and right is wrong. Amen. That's right. The world's waiting to see that in our day. We're called to be what? Ministers of the New Testament. Look back at verse 6. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament? Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Amen. When, when, we, when we just have our toes in the water, God says, come out a little deeper. Come out a little deeper. Amen. Right? When, when, we're, when we're functioning under the empowerment of the ministry of the Spirit, when we're functioning in the grace of God, in the ministry of righteousness, and God is making us able, not ourselves, if we understand that, 
If we understand those things, life will never be the same again. Amen. Life will never be the same again. So I ask you this morning, are you living a shallow Christian life? Are you living a shallow Christian? Are you being are you being an able minister of the grace of God, which is far more glorious than the law ever has been? Amen. Are you living your life as a child of God that is pleasing to God? Are you living the life that God would have you to live? If not, then today is the day that says, hey, no more. I'm, I am going to live how God wants me to live. Amen. Jesus Christ is much more. He is far more than we chalk him up to be, that we can conjure up in our minds for him to be. So why not serve him much more? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time. Of